Well, hi, you guys. Hey. We're doing another video. This oh, is amazing. I didn't see you there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hey, we're having fun. We're, we're sort of doing a uh, Highlights and Hope where we highlight uh, different things going on, our, our experience at our celebration, especially as a feature, and hopefully uh, encourage and bring hope to those who watch. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'm Mark. This is Daniel and Sam, and we're part of the team here at Everyday Church in Aurora Grande, California. You're always welcome to come. Check us out at everydaychurch.com. But anyway, yesterday we talked about this big question which is essentially, you know, is God angry? Yeah. yeah. And um, the message was actually is, you know, why does the Old Testament God seem so angry and violent? But really at the core, it's, is God angry? And people yeah. want to know that, right? Yeah. And I've used the illustration that a lot of people think of God like the statue of Abraham, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. God's sitting, stern look, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't mess up, you know. And uh, I was just going to ask you guys maybe about your, you both grew up in church? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you were taught about God from an early age. Yeah. And what was your overall impression about the answer to that question? Did you think of God as angry or? Yeah. I, I could go. Um, I mean, first off, I, I, I was raised with what I would consider to be a healthy fear of the Lord. That I, I what, do, it, what does explain fear? Do you mean if you were afraid of God? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, just first off, the the scripture saying that the the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That uh, I don't know. I mean, if you walk up next to a cliff and you get the the feel uh, to a cliff, or or you come up to the ocean where the waves are crashing large and powerfully, that that instills a type of fear mm. of awe and respect. That that I'm gonna I'm gonna tread carefully. I'm gonna. I'm that's gonna... a good that's a good illustration because the the cliff isn't dangerous. Yeah. Unless you cross a line. Yeah. And you can stand at that cliff and experience great beauty. Yes. But you got to know your limits. Yeah. So you're saying that's what God is like. Like you, He's beautiful, but you got to know your limits. Yeah. Yeah. That that um, every I've I've come to believe that every emotion comes from God, and you know, anger is just it's just another emotion, one of one of a wide palette of emotions that we humans that's a part of the human experience that is a gift from God to us. So so anger is, I don't see anger as necessarily positive or negative, good or evil. It's, it's just an emotional tone or color that, that is, um, it's, it's something to tread carefully. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's something to navigate, it's, not all willy-nilly. It's, it's powerful, but it can be like nitroglycerin. You want to you wanna handle it carefully. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Sam, how about you growing up in the church yeah. world as a Christian? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, so I, thankfully, I was given the opportunity to have a relationship with the Lord at a young age. Like I, it was a relational, I was taught the relationship with the Lord, not necessarily just the rules of religion, but the caveat there is I was, and still am, really prone to feeling shameful or very guilty. So even like as a kid, I would feel very guilty for something that my mom would be like, it's okay, no big deal. So that's not necessarily your view of God. That's a, sometimes a personality trait. Yeah, but it caused me to have a unhealthy fear of God. Even, mm. Where Jesus, I had a relationship with, and I actually went to DeSozo as an adult and realized that with Jesus, I was all good because he was my friend. He was the relational side, but with God the Father, there was more this, you're waiting to punish me. Mm. I'm I'm so terrible. I'm so wrong that you are angry with me. But that, was, that wasn't that was truth. So, And how, how was it? I'm, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze yeah, you, but how was your relationship with your dad? Was he angry? Did, so, not, not to no, make him feel bad. but No, no, no. I have a great relationship with my dad. There would be moments where, you know, he would raise his voice a bit. But no abuse, no nothing like okay. that. So it really, truly was. So it could have been a combination of your view of God, your personality type, yeah. you were sensitive. Um, it's almost like I was viewing God through the lens I viewed myself in some oh, ways mm -hmm. where it's just, it's, it's like, you know, we're all our worst critic. And I yeah. think I just assumed God was that critic in some <clears throat> ways, though I knew he was loving there just was that. And yeah. so honestly it took some healing and 
recognizing that, oh, there's a wall between me and God the Father, and he didn't put that there. I've actually put that well, there. Well, you're bringing up a really, really interesting point because, you know, on Google, is God angry is a big question. Yeah. So people are searching for that. Is, is God angry? He, he, he seems angry. I hear from certain Christians act like he's angry. Yeah. But now, having heard from you, it sort of sounds like maybe sometimes it depends on who's asking the question. Like, yeah. maybe I'm asking the question because of my issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rather than I've been taught that God's angry, maybe I'm nervous about authority figures, or, yeah. I, or I feel bad, or I feel ashamed, or I struggle with shame. And, and therefore, anybody that has a standard, yeah. I'm assuming is angry. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One guy said it like this. He said, um, he said, what do you believe is the basic disposition of God? Is he primarily mad, glad, or sad? You know, which is a great question. Is God yeah. sort of wringing his hands at the earth? It's like, oh man, everything's terrible. I wish, oh, this is so hard. Why don't they just obey me? I don't know where things are going. So is he sad, bummed out, or is he angry? Like, I can't believe these people. Yeah. Or is he glad? And I, what I read in the Bible, and, the, and as I've spent time getting to know God, I find that he's supremely glad like he's his disposition is happy one of the verses that demonstrate this is Zephaniah 317 where it says uh, the Lord s sings over you he'll he'll dance over you and with shouts of joy and like an angry God doesn't do that kind of stuff you know yeah. he's yeah. he's happy yeah. and it says in his presence is fullness of joy so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. how would you have fullness of joy in an yeah. angry God's presence He's got joy in his own presence. Yeah. He's happy. Yeah. I like the movie The Shack because I feel like it really showed the joy between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God is happy in his own community of the Trinity, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thought because then I, becoming a Christian is really being inserted into the community of yeah. the Trinity, which has got tremendous yeah. joy and tremendous peace and tremendous honor, and I get to be in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it means to be a Christian. Like yeah. that's a whole different dimension than I have to obey some rules yeah. and disappoint an angry God. Well, and honestly, becoming a parent changed my I mean, just odd then within seconds was like, oh my gosh, if God was willing to give his son, I can't imagine like that is the most valuable, precious thing to me. I can't imagine being willing to give my child on the mm. behalf of someone who was hurting me. Yeah. You know what I mean? On well, God path. so loved the world yes. when the world wasn't loving God. Yeah, yeah. He so, loved us before we responded to him. Yeah, so it's like, no, an angry God does not send his one and only son to die, Yeah. you know, and out of love. And yeah. so so there there may be emotions of, of anger because I know – Part of, part of that is there is a scripture that talks about God was angry. There's scriptures that says God was angry. And, yep. But I don't believe that he's angry with, he's angry with sin. He's angry just as if my kid did something wrong that I knew was going to hurt them. Or if someone else did something to hurt my kid, it would be wrong for me to not be angry. It, it would be a child. lack of care. Yes. Like, oh yeah, that's okay. No big deal. Like, what? Yeah, no. You should be angry. That's yes. it. So anger comes from a few different things. It comes from injustice. Yeah. It, when it's when it's selfish, or, or it can be selfish, it comes from a blocked goal. So somebody stops what we're trying to do. We can become angry, right? We're trying to go down the freeway. Somebody pulls in front of us. We get angry because they stopped us from going the speed the speed that we wanted to go. That can be good or bad. But. Um, but anger in itself, like you said, Daniel, is just an emotion amongst an array of emotions. I think the key here is what is God's basic disposition? And, and what I see is his basic disposition is he's good, he's happy, but he definitely gets angry. And I was trying to say that yesterday yeah. in the message that, that there are, you know, that, that we are really big in our culture on tolerance, you know? Yes. And, and that's a good thing because it's, it's stopped bullying, it's, it's caused us to accept ourselves and accept others. And so tolerance has been amazing, but sometimes too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Yeah. And I find that sometimes what people do is they say, well, hey, this is, there's a problem. Let's put more tolerance on it. Mm -hmm. When in reality, we should say, no, that's evil and wrong. Mm -hmm. Like there are religions that they call themselves peaceful, but they do such terrible things to people. We shouldn't tolerate that. We should say no. We should object to that and say this is not okay. But sometimes in tolerance, we just accept weird behavior. We accept... Danger, th dangerous things that happen to our kids, yeah. uh, and so yeah, I, I I think that 
I was trying to use parenting as an example that good parents are going to feel anger at times as they should. Yeah. You know, when you're, you, you have two children and your, your son is bigger and stronger and he beats up on your daughter who's smaller and more fragile, not that I'm not saying a man woman thing, but just, that's just the situation. You're going to be angry with your son. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. You can't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. And maybe he's not listening to you till he sees that you're angry and that there could be a consequence, which is the fear of a parent that's healthy. Yeah. Not, yeah. I'm afraid of you, cower, or you're going to hit me, but just like, wow, I made mom and dad mad. And it takes a lot for them to get mad. Yeah. There's, there's a level of response that is appropriate, that, that is the, it's the appropriate and proper response given what given the situation given what's happening and i think that's right. that that's tied into the justice of god that yeah. that that he wouldn't be just he wouldn't be just if the scales didn't balance out in the end and and it's it's the, the this is where the fear of the lord comes back in because it's not it's not according to me what i feel is the right uh, the right to wrong, uh, you know, the, the right balance to 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 right the wrongs, yeah. the injustices that are done. It's it's he's the one who holds the scales, and he's the one that will right the scales. And so the fear of the Lord part, kind of to just, I, I guess, kind of bring it back home and, and and tie in what I was saying earlier is that that like when those scales are righted, I I fear, like I want to be on the right side of the scales because you and I don't fully know how it's going to land. Yes. I mean, yeah. with there, I believe we can be assured of our salvation. I don't mean that, but I mean, you know, our works are going to be judged, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and we don't know exactly. I mean, we have some indicators, obviously, but we don't know exactly how God's going to see everything. Yeah. And it should produce a fear of not going all the way up to the line every time, but staying clear of the line Yeah. and saying, I want to be in the safe zone. Yeah. So and that's a well, good, healthy yeah. fear. And Tolerance and allowance does not equal love. And right now the message is allowance and tolerance equals love. That's how you show love. Right. But it's not. Right. Truth in love. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that truth in love and and that is it's a hard it's it's the hardest thing to say and sometimes sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. If it's like, is his shirt green? Yes, his shirt is green. But if we're talking about something else and you say the shirt is green you know what I mean? It well, can... it's so uh, there's faith and then there's the object of our faith. Yeah. So I can tell you this microphone is God. And if you don't believe me, you're intolerant. Mm -hmm. But I'm forcing my belief on you. So what I'm saying is you have to believe what I believe about my sexuality, about my political view, about my race, about whatever. And, you know, it's not just it's, it, of course, we don't want to be racist. We want to accept people of all races, but not necessarily all the propaganda that goes with everything that we say about ourselves, right? Do you see the difference? So you can't just arbitrarily say, I'm this, this is this, this is my reality. You must believe it and buy into it. There has to be discord and uh, discussion and debate and dialogue because that's how we all get better. And what's going on in our country right now in the name of tolerance is we're shutting down dialogue. Yeah. Like people yeah. aren't free to disagree without being called a name. And that's very concerning to me. And to me, that's in many ways worse than God getting angry. It's like people being controlling of other people and controlling the narrative and controlling the conversation. And I, so that, that all kind of came up in the talk. I know I saw one or two people struggling with those concepts, but, but they're real. Yeah. And they need to be talked about because they're not being talked about. You know, it's hard. We're, we live in a cancel culture where if you talk about things that people don't like, they just cancel you. And it used to be that, um, I've shared this a lot of times, but I think you guys maybe have heard me say it, but I went to the Kennedy Memorial. Did I talk about that when you were there? I don't know that I've heard it. So um, my wife and I visited Boston and we went to the John F. Kennedy Memorial. So it's a beautiful, beautiful building. Yeah. And I remember walking downstairs and there were looping videos of Nixon and Kennedy debating. And I started crying actually because it was so courteous, so respectful. Mr. President, you know, Nixon, Mr. President, oh. and he would say his thing and then the, you know, Kennedy would talk to Nixon, but he talked to him respectfully, yeah. you know. Civil and today, or... yeah, today there's just so much... Just uh, well, it's called ad hominem attack is when you attack the person for their position. Mm. 
And that's happening all the time. And I think it happens to God. So God's position is, this is right, this is wrong, this is okay, this is not okay. It's called sin. And people attack God and say, he's Victorian, he's intolerant, he's this, that. It's like, actually, that's just your viewpoint. Can God actually say who he is? Because he says he's loving, kind, and merciful, and good to a thousand generations, but he also deals with evil. So it doesn't make him angry, it makes him healthy. So I think sometimes yeah. our, our definition in the cult in culture have changed so much. And I think now we're starting to call, like we talked about earlier, we're starting to call good, bad, bad, good, wrong, right, right, wrong. This is that. This, and and it's, it's, it's mind-numbing because, in, because the media supports certain narratives and doesn't give room for other narratives. So there's no counterbalance to these statements that are being made that are just absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. But there's no chance for people to have healthy dialogue and debate. So I think tolerance is a beautiful thing when it's done well and when it's in the right amount of proportion, but it's not the highest form of love. Yeah. It's a part of love. But sometimes the highest form of love is no, mm -hmm. you're wrong. Yeah. That's not okay. It's not just whatever goes is we just have to take it and accept it and be excited about it. No, that's yeah. not. That's. That's good up to a point, and then there has to come a time where we just blow the whistle, yeah. you know? I mean, it's a little bit to me like an intervention. Like if somebody's addicted to drugs and alcohol and you've tried to come alongside, I want to be your friend, just diversion, what if we do this yeah. instead? Yeah. You've done all of that for years and years and years, and finally the family, with fear and trembling, says, we need to confront yeah. this person. And almost every time the person gets angry, cusses, name calls, and makes, tries to make the people doing the intervention feel horrible. Yeah. And I think that's sometimes what happens to the Christian God. Yeah. Like, He's a beautiful God mm -hmm. who gets a bad rap because our culture's kind of weird right now, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, the culture's been weird in the past in other ways, but right now those are some of the weird things that are going on is that people don't want anyone to tell them no. They don't want anyone to have a truth that could be different than their truth. In other words, we don't want objective truth. We don't want any standards. My truth is the truth. That's all I have to worry about, which isn't true. I always like to use the illustration of a four-way stop. You know, what would happen if people said my truth at a four-way stop? <laughs> my truth is I need, to get to, I need to get to work, so I'm not stopping. I'm in a hurry and I can't be late, so my truth is I'm going through that stop. And the other one says my truth is I need to go to the hospital. I'm not feeling well. I don't have time to stop for this stuff. You know? And there's four people with their truth. Yeah. And then there's a, a fatality crash, a four-way crash. You, know? yeah. you have to stop even though you don't feel like you should have to. Yeah. Because there's a standard that's higher than you. Yeah. And it's called a stop sign, which is reinforced by the, the government. You know, so things like that. Anyway, yeah. any other thoughts just about that? And then I want to switch to the yeah. other part of the message, which was about hope. It's about yeah. Hosea. And, but any other thoughts about? I guess I just have one question. So if we were to sum it up in one sentence for you, is God angry? Answer being? Absolutely not. As a person, as a disposition, he's happy. Does he get angry? Definitely. Yeah. Does he have a right to get angry? A hundred percent. So he's not an angry God, but he's a God who gets angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Is that good? Can we move on? Yep. We, yep. Okay, so then the other part, you were saying to me earlier, Sam, that you really appreciated uh, that because I, what happened was, for those of you that are watching, if you weren't with us um, at our service on Sunday, yesterday, uh, I was in prayer, actually, before the service, and I felt like the Lord was like, don't just give that message. You need to give another message about hope. And so I felt led to look at Hosea 2 while we were praying and sort of quickly mm -hmm. developed a bit of an outline of a message. Yeah. So part two. Yeah. And you were saying you wish I would have talked more about that. Why did, why did you say that? Well, it just, I mean, it felt really, I know that's such a funny, it's like, is God angry? <laughs> no, he's not, but he, and then hope, you know. But it did feel very timely, and I, forgive me, I can't remember the four that you went down. Do you remember? Uh, I think the first one was reality, which, like, you know, because Hosea starts with God told him to marry a prostitute, yeah. and she wasn't a great gal, and it was hard. So reality was hard to face for Hosea and Gomer, Gomer's his wife, the prostitute. But then by the time you get to chapter 2, um, 
think it was restoration. Is it? Restoration, repair, respond. Res respond, uh, or maybe it was respond. No, respond came after restoration. Right. It's yeah. like restore, respond, and then, um, I don't know, they're, they're, I'm missing one. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Um, but overall, it just felt like a timely word, a hope-filled word, and a, um, I would say a timely word specifically for every day, that there was this moment of reality. Okay, this is what we can see. But there's always this reality of what we cannot see, and God does not always make sense. The way he does things, I mean, if we were to play that story now, I think we, if, if that person were to come to us and say, this is my plan, I feel like God told me to marry this prostitute. Well, does this prostitute want to give her life to the Lord? No, she does not. <laughs> we would all be like, do not get married. <clears throat> eh? yeah. No way, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that does, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't make sense at all, but yet it's one of the most beautiful stories at the end of the story. It's yeah. such a beautiful, like, oh my gosh, we're never too far gone. God always is chasing after us, running after us, and his ways are so much higher than our ways and our thoughts because had he listened to probably even the people around him, they would have been like, divorce her, she's gone, you know what I mean? I don't or even don't, know. Even, don't even marry her like you're yeah. saying. If they yeah. went to premaritals, they would not have matched up. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, and so I just, that story specifically is so, it's it's sobering at the beginning because it's like, oh man, that's really sad and terrible. And But then as the story progresses, there is so much hope and beauty in it. And even this, the relationship with, um, is it Israel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how God relates that to Israel of saying, this is Israel to me. Yeah. And I'm going to restore her beauty. And I feel like that is relating to the body of Christ, that he is going to restore our beauty. I'm not yeah. saying that we are prostitutes, but I think in many ways, the American church specifically has had a lot of idols. A lot of distractions. A lot of distractions, a lot of things, you know. I mean, um, the, the hard language is other lovers. We've had yeah. other, other loves, things that we've loved way more than God. And that's, that's a, you know, that's what... That's what unfaithfulness looks like, yeah. right? We're unfaithful to God because we love this other thing more. And um, there's a returning to our first love. There's yeah. a returning to to that. Yeah, and I think it's it's a beautiful thing because the the verse that really got me was where it says that um, I will give to her for the valley of Acor a door of hope. Yeah. So the word Acor means trouble. So for the and valley, you know. You go through a valley, you don't, it's not a moment, you know, it's, it's a season. Yeah. So she's just, you know, she was a prostitute, but she had, what, there was a reason. She had yeah. had a lot of trouble. She may have had trouble because she was a prostitute, but she probably became a prostitute because she had trouble, yeah. right? Some stuff happened, which was difficult. In that culture, very difficult for a woman, whether she was divorced or her husband passed away, to make a living. Who knows all the stuff she yeah. went through. And what God was saying wasn't so much, you're bad, you've been a prostitute, but like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all this trouble and I'm going to turn it into a door of hope. Mm -hmm. And then this next verse says, so that she will sing again. So that's an amazing, like, hope, you know hope has taken root in your heart when your song comes back. You know, and I've had seasons in my life where I just, I'm not singing. Not that I'm a singer. It's not about your musical ability. It's about... You know, just your ability to sing, to, yeah. to, to have a lilt in your voice, to have a skip in your step. And, and sometimes that, you know, life beats that out of you. Yeah. And God's promising to her, which really was to Israel, you know, my darling Israel, I'm going to restore hope to you so you can sing again. Yeah. You've lost your voice. You've lost your song. I want you to have that back. Yeah. And then, and that's the R word I can't remember, and then I'm gonna also going to restore, I'm going to restore your fortunes, I'm going to restore your blessing. And, um, and so it's just an amazing, and I think that the reason I felt like the Lord wanted me to say that, even though it may have felt a little disconnecting from, is God angry? Okay, hope. Is because I think it's hard just to have messages on, you know, what's the series called that we're in? Jesus, uh, Jesus and Hard Questions. We can't just get answers to our questions. We need our hearts so that our minds can have rest. Like, okay, now I feel like I have an answer. Yeah. But our hearts are still, they need hope. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, you know, if you look at statistically the amount of suicides in our, since you guys have been alive, but especially since I've been alive, it's unbelievable. And at the root is the lack of hope, mm -hmm. you know, 
the root of depression, the root of suicide is a lack of hope. I just don't think there are any options for me. I don't, I don't see why I should even live. And so when God promises to give someone hope, that's an amazing thing, you know. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that's... I think, yeah. yeah. Especially being a worshiper. I'm like, yes, sing. <laughs> because, not, not just because of I like to sing, but there's so much power. And David came up and gave that prophetic word about just the church rising up and, and yeah. worship and it being a battle cry. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part of it, that this song that comes out... It can be restorative to our own souls, but it can also be such a like weapon, such a yeah. weapon against yeah. the enemy, such yeah. a pushback to where I genuinely, there are moments in worship where I am like praying and interceding that as I sing out the, the, the sound waves that God would be in it, you know, he yeah. spoke and light became he yeah, spoke things into being Absolutely. and so we can sing things yeah. yep. <laughs> and he can carry those sound waves and supernaturally use them to even bring healing to bring hope and it's one of those things you can't convince someone of hope yeah. you can't just tell them over and over be hopeful be faithful do da, da, da. he loves you he loves you there has to be this moment on the inside of our souls and our spirits that's like Oh, there's a coming alive, there's an awakening, there's something. Mm, mm. And that, I feel like majority of the times comes through an encounter, whether it be in worship or in prayer, there is something that happens and it's it's something carried. It's not something necessarily just simply heard. You know, it's something carried and received. It's like a download all yeah, of a sudden. And, that's excellent. You know, and so that is that is really that moment I was like, yes, all, all behind it. And I just felt like it was anointed and it wasn't, it was just really good. Yeah. You know, it's interesting about the voice thing. Um, so we started a house of prayer years ago called Voices. Voices mm -hmm. House of Prayer. We called yeah, it VHOP, cool. you know. <laughs> and just modeling the name after all the other houses of prayer. Uh, but really what we were trying to do was communicate that Voices is a, is a movement. It's, it goes back to the priesthood of all believers. It's a movement of God's people. And, yeah. and where I got it from was I was up at four in the morning one morning with the Lord, and I was reading Acts chapter 4 where... Peter and John had been arrested for healing the guy, and they just got out of uh, they just got out of jail. And it says they came to wherever the church was meeting in somebody's house or in a building, and they yeah. it says they raised their voices together and said. And then there's one prayer recorded, which is fascinating. So everybody had a voice, but only one prayer was recorded. It's a lot like worship. Everybody has a voice, but we sing a song. Yeah. yeah. Or there's a leader or or a band or whatever, and so. It can be a both end. It's not yeah. having a leader doesn't de negate the people. Mm -hmm. Having a song doesn't negate everyone's expression. voice, yeah. expression. So anyway, so we called it Voices for that That's reason. Cool. And uh, I believe right now, uh, not just now, but the past several years, God, in my mind, has been shifting that focus from prayer to worship. So there, there was a prayer movement that was needed to, to sort of be accentuated. But really, really, Voices is a worship and prayer movement, not a prayer and worship movement. It's a worship. And I feel like in some of the things that we tossed around today yeah. and that we're hearing prophesied and that we're sensing are, I feel like that's where things are going is, is more into worship. You know, I mean, it's good to have strategy. It's good to think about how to do things better. But at the end of the day, we need to worship God. And David's word was right on. And when you were talking about voices, you know, the voice, what, what you belong for in worship, what you both Think about that when you play your instrument, that the sound goes out. I think of yeah. Psalm 29, which says, The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of yeah, Lebanon, that wow. his voice destroys giant, like giant trees explode. I mean, it's not that God's trying to, it's, it's yeah. the power of his yeah. voice. Yeah. And I think that when we think about worship, it's not just, okay, let's get through this song, three songs so we can get on to the message. It's so powerful, and I think that we've talked a little bit about there being warfare, and there yeah. being opposition at times, and, yeah. and you know, the Bible says Judah will go first. Judah means pray, so worship is a is a weapon. Worship is a warfare, and I think that uh, it, it restores hope. You know, yeah. when we sing the truth about who God is and who how we yeah. are in relation to God. Yeah. It restores hope because we yeah. find our proper place in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. See, what's going on right now is so many people believe, are being taught, actually, that, that they're God, that they decide everything, that their standard is the standard. And it actually, in the end of the day, it destroys people. 
because we're not created to be God. We are created beings by God, and we function best and the most healthiest when we're in proper relationship with him. We're not less than because he's more than. Yeah. And a lot of people think that, like, I can't have anyone over me or be bigger than me or more important than me, but that's, that's entirely not true. We know that we're finite beings. Yeah. We know we don't know everything. So why wouldn't we embrace a God who does? Yeah. yeah. Who can yeah. do everything and knows everything and wants to help us. Yeah. And knows the instruction manual on how we were built. Yeah. Knows how to help us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, oh, you go. Uh, uh, it, like a conclusion for me in terms of perspective is uh, on both sides of the equation. Is God angry? Question mark. Uh, hope. You know, it, 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 is there hope? Can we have hope? Um, the... the the, the 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 through line for me the thread that goes through it all is is how does God see things it, is God angry question mark if so why and if, if those scales are going to balance out how can I be on the right side of it how does He see it how, does He see me on this side of the scale or that side of the scale that's on the anger side of things so it's like I, I want that's the fear of the Lord side of things but then on the hope side of things it's like if I'm if I'm trudging along in despair and like, is there, is there hope? Is there, if, if he is joyful, if in his, in, in, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Well, it's like, how can I get some of that? Um, how, how can I, <laughs> how can I get me like, some of that? Yeah. It's like, God, if, if you see things in a joyful manner, I, God, I laid down my perspective. Yeah. I submit, like, yeah. teach me your ways, God. Yeah. Uh, so I want to tune in. I want to. I want to abide. I want to come into the vine and abide and receive the nutrients yeah. of heaven. I want that. I want you to release that joy in me and through me. You know. Yeah. Um, hey, I don't want to go on too long because I. Yeah. This is super yeah. fun. You know, I think our talks have been like pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> but what if we ended? Would you be open to um, just praying for the people that are watching and just asking God to just give them a proper perspective of Himself and and hope, yeah. you know? Yeah. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. God, we're just so thankful for your hope. God, we're so thankful for you, God. Just every part of you, God, let us not be leery of any part of who you are, God. Let us understand you in ways like we've never been able to understand before. God, give us eyes to see and the ears to hear, God, how you are speaking, the song that you're singing over us, mm. God. Yeah. Lord, I pray that we'd be in tune with the songs that you are singing over us, that you would give us back the song of hope and of joy and of worship and warfare, God, all in the same. God, those are your weapons. Your weapons are joy and hope and peace and love, and you work through it, God, and you stand above it all. You reign above it all. You are king. Mm. Every single knee will bow and every tongue will will confess that you are Lord. We just choose to do it now. <laughs> yeah. We choose to say that you are Lord. You are King above it all, God. And we submit to your ways. And we even just ask that your word would renew our minds, God, that we would be daily transformed into your likeness, Father God, that we would be little Christ. God, we would be like you, Father God, in everything we say, do, and think. And Father God, I even pray that you'd begin to convict our hearts if we're watching things, if we're listening to things, if it's even just our self-talk. Um, mm. that's causing us to view you differently. God, show us how we are viewing you wrong. Show us yeah. in the ways that you want you want us to see you. Show us ways where we thought something was truth, but it wasn't, God. And I thank you, Father God, that you're giving us just even a boldness and a courage and a strength that is not on our own foundation, but it's on the foundation of you and your word. And through everything, God, let your love be, be shown and be seen more than anything else, mm. God. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. Amen. It's good stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part. And we'll see you next time.